Hello, and a very warm welcome once again to National Book Festival Presents, brought to you by the Library of Congress. My name is Maria Rana, and I'm the Literary Director of the Library of Congress. In this series, Understanding the Pandemic, we mean to provide a little clarity and context to the times in which we live. Our guest today is a remarkably versatile writer whose work has ranged from deeply researched investigative journalism to wry, satirical, even dystopian fiction. He brings drama and color to his subjects as only a very observant, practiced writer can. Carl Taro Greenfeld is the author most recently of the dystopian novel, The Subprimes. But the work we are focusing on today is this extraordinarily prescient nonfiction book about the SARS epidemic, The China Syndrome. He's here to talk about how it relates to our current experience with the coronavirus, COVID-19. Interviewing him is my very talented colleague, Roswell Encina, Chief of Communications at the Library of Congress, who brings considerable journalistic experience of his own as a former television reporter. Great to have you with us, Roswell. Thank you, Marie. And thank you for joining us, Carl. We appreciate it. How are you doing in Los Angeles? Uh, we're okay here, thank you. We've been lucky. We've gotten some good weather, so it's not as dreary as it was uh, in March when uh, when everything seemed really dire and the weather seemed also appropriately bad. Now, Carl is the author of The China Syndrome that came out almost, what, more than 10 years ago. Um, you were the editor of Time Asia when the SARS epidemic um, happened um, in China and Hong Kong and parts of Asia in 2002 to 2003. Just to remind folks, um, what is the difference between SARS of 2003 to COVID-19 of 2020? Uh, besides the fact that COVID-19 became a global pandemic and SARS didn't, um, there's very little different between them. They're both coronaviruses. They both emerged um, out uh, for, you know, from Southern or Central China in, uh, in the spring of their, or late winter of their respective years. Um, and both caused initial panic and crisis in uh, in hospital systems in China uh, and SARS in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, COVID-19 did what SARS didn't quite do, which became a, a global calamity. Um, and SARS sort of miraculously, in part due to what looks like seasonality of the virus itself, never quite uh, became established around the world in the same way. But the initial crisis was very, very similar. Now, speaking of this crisis, you did some excellent reporting on your book and the team at um, Time Asia during uh, the SARS epidemic. I mean, this book, um, if I, I, I should admit, if I read this like six to eight months ago, I would have been like, well, that was fun and interesting. And that could never happen. You know, six to eight months later, um, this book pretty much unfolded like what's happening now. Um, you start off by talking about in the book about the era of wild flavor in China. For folks who don't live in Asia, could you tell folks what is wild flavor and what are wet markets when it comes to China and parts of um, Southeast Asia? Yeah, I mean, what 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 happened was in 2002, China was going through a prolonged economic boom that had pretty much started uh, after Tiananmen Square when Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, made that proclamation. I believe in Shenzhen to get rich is glorious. And China went was going through this prolonged economic boom. Uh, and one of the ways uh, the sort of the new, very wealthy Chinese businessmen like to like to show face was to uh, dine on ever increasing and, and more exotic animal species. Uh, so and, and, and that was I mean, also, these animals were considered to have health giving properties or good luck. Uh, and so there was an explosion or not an explosion, but a, a, a real a real increase in the popularity of, of a wide variety of species. And commensurately, these the, the these Chinese wet markets or wild flavor markets, excuse me, <coughs> also really expanded. And so in southern China, you had these 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 massive, almost industrial scale uh, wild animal markets. And I'd, I'd been going to China uh, pretty regularly over the preceding, uh, pretty much since China opened up, so say in the late 80s. And whereas before you would have kind of just a few stalls of a few different species, by the early 2000s, these markets had reached an industrial scale where you had every species imaginable crammed into these pens. I mean, you had snakes, you had uh, uh, 
cats, you had raccoons, you had camels, you had uh, 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 civet cats who would turn out to be a crucial interme intermediary species in terms of virus transmission. So the, the industrialization of the exotic animal trade uh, was one of the factors that or it, it, it had happened along with China becoming very, very wealthy. Now, um, as you know, there's been a lot of reports of, from COVID-19 that the virus probably started in a wet market also in China. Um, it, so it begs the question, so if this happened in most almost 17 years ago, how could it still be happening in 2020? Why are there still wild animals being sold in wet markets in China? Well, I mean, initially after SARS, I mean, what, what happened with SARS was that a, a few virologists, uh, uh, Guan Yi notably, from uh, Hong Kong University had gone to these Chinese wet markets to actually establish uh, that there was viral transmission and, vi and like sort of gene swapping happening in these markets. Um, and Guan Yi went so far as actual sm actually smuggle samples back across the border. Um, and those samples turned out to be crucial in terms of identifying what the SARS virus was. Um, so initially in late 2003, when I went back to those markets, there was some regulatory effort, and China, especially at that time, was very sensitive uh, about possibly losing the Beijing Olympics. So they made an, an effort to cur curtail these wet markets and sort of try to uh, regulate them into a somewhat more reasonable state. But really, within one year, the markets were back, uh, and, and in the intervening years, they've probably expanded and, and doubled again in terms of size. Uh, also, as China has become even wealthier, in this intervening period, these markets have become even larger. You, you said um, you know, these markets and how China try to get rid of some of the wild animals. Like um, in your book, you said like Guan Yi now knew how to stop the disease, close the markets. Once the human chain of infection was broken, as long as the market stayed closed, SARS could be contained. Um, so I'm gonna be injecting some questions because we asked some of our uh, folks who follow the Library of Congress on Twitter and on Facebook, some questions for you. One question from Minnesota says, Will it be hard to change the culture of selling wild animals in wet markets in China? Yeah, yeah, it's turned out to be almost impossible uh, because the the uh, animal trade and the serving of, of exotic animals is such a part of uh, the kind of culture of prosperity. Um, if the first generation of very wealthy Chinese wanted to uh, just simply have uh, better food, this new generation of ultra wealthy Chinese wants to have ever more exotic food. So it would be, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost, I mean, to, it, it, you could equate it uh, with a status symbol, like having a, you know, a, you know like having a, 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 a Birkin bag or something, that it becomes a kind of status symbol in Chinese society. So what you're fighting against is not just a cultural preference, but also an assertion of a kind of success. So, so it's not just about uh, try. It's you know, it's not just about trying to change dietary habits. It's more about trying to change what the the uh, the appearance of prosperity is. And the big chunk of this book talks about how hospitals and the medical community in China and Hong Kong reacted to SARS in two thousand three. Um, the big part of it is what we see during the when the virus starts to. Um, go through China, especially through Beijing and through Hong Kong, is the system failure of some of the hospitals, which I think is the biggest fear of what may happen here in the US or in other uh, hospitals around the globe. Do you think are the hospital systems in this country um, were able to learn something or did China learn something from 2003 when it comes to hospitals? I, I think so much about that, about the what we learned from 2003, what we didn't learn, how the response was better, how the response was uh, in some ways perhaps not informed by what had come before. Um, I think initially when a new respiratory virus appears in a hospital system, uh, doctors and nurses and, and clinicians don't really have a playbook for how to respond. Everyone is kind of responding to the previous outbreak. In this case, the, you know, it, it, and, and certainly in the US, the first assumption when a respiratory patient shows up is usually influenza um, or a variation of influenza. Um, and so measures are taken and we, and we know how to treat influenza. We know how to respond to influenza. Um, with, uh, with SARS in 2003, what happened was Hong, uh, hospitals had become very familiar with dealing with 
uh, uh, respiratory viruses with a certain protocol of dealing with respiratory viruses and infection control had become a little bit lax in that we tend to, we came to rely on antibiotics to deal with, uh, to, you know, to deal with respiratory diseases rather than practice the kind of strict barrier uh, protection, which we now see when you see doctors wearing the face mask and the eye shield and the gloves and all of that. That is something which uh, certainly in 2003, doctors weren't doing uh, when patients were showing up because they didn't know that there was a highly contagious, uh, very high mortality rate virus that had begun to circulate in the population. I think a similar thing happened in the US initially um, where doctors just hadn't faced a respiratory virus of this kind of lethality in, in you know, probably in the U.S. since, I guess, since 2009. But even in 2009, I don't think the transmissibility of H1N1 was anything like uh, what we've seen with, 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 with this coronavirus. Uh, so, yeah, I think one of the issues is the hospital systems uh, have to, the, the, the first challenge is for frontline responders and for hospital systems to understand how to, uh, how to, how to deal with the, uh, these respiratory cases. Um, and once that is established, then you, you do see what we're seeing now, which is a better, which is kind of a lowering of the mortality rate and slightly better results. But the first wave, uh, certainly in Hong Kong in 2003, we saw the hospital system really pushed to its limits and in many cases crashing. I mean, Prince of Wales Hospital, uh, I think like over 100 clinicians were infected. Um, and, and when you have this community wide, this kind of community outbreak like we had in Hong Kong, uh, you do see hospital systems really pushed to the brink because they don't have the, they don't know the treatment protocol. Treatment protocols haven't been established. And in 2003, it was kind of shameful that Chinese doctors weren't initially sharing with their colleagues in Hong Kong the right way to treat these patients, the right way to treat uh, what were then SARS patients. I think this time, uh, the you know China uh, Chinese doctors have made more of an effort to share uh, what they've learned in terms of treatment protocols with Western doctors. Um, and I think that's made some difference, but I think in other areas, China has in repeated many of the uh, uh, malfeasances or many of the mistakes that they made in 2003, especially with regards to uh, continued secrecy and suppressing information. And notably like Dr. Lee, for example, in Wuhan, who was arrested for uh, trying to get the news out about this virus. Um, so it, it is surprising to me after what we went through in 2003 that we have, uh, in some cases, China making some of the same mistakes that they made back then. In other areas, China's behaved a lot better. Certainly cooperating with the WHO, which was a huge issue in 2003. China was really actively trying to hide uh, the severity of the outbreak from the WHO. This time, China seems to be cooperating much more with the WHO. Uh, in fact, um, the U.S. government is now accusing the WHO and China of being in a kind of conspiracy against the U.S., which is amazing. If you if you were if you followed 2003 outbreak, China and WHO were really uh, uh, at, at, uh, at at loggerheads. I know you you reported here in the book that um, some hospitals were hiding the SARS patients in ambulances and let them being driven around Beijing so um, the WHO inspectors won't see these patients. You also reported here in the book that the unwillingness of the Chinese Ministry of Health to communicate what they knew was just one among many critical delays that allowed the disease to spread from Guangdong to Hong Kong to Hanoi and now to the rest of mainland China. So it sounds like some of the breakdown was just the reporting from the hospitals to the government and um, just maybe fudging the numbers a little bit that caused yeah. some major problems. Yeah, I, th I think it's always it's it, we, we always have to remember that the political the political impulse to hide the severity of a disease outbreak, which is which has much more to do with propaganda and much more to do with with, uh, uh, you know, with trying to uh, reassure the public that, it, you know, about the severity of a disease outbreak there. The cost to that is that information, the cost to this this curtailing of information is that other doctors in other countries, when they're confronted with this uh, you know, novel virus, don't know how to treat it. They don't. They haven't been told what this is. They haven't told the severity of it. They haven't told best practices. So there's a real human cost to a government uh, for propaganda purposes, trying to you know to limit the spread of information about disease. If you limit the spread of information, you're actually increasing the spread of disease. 
I mean, the two were kind of in inverse proportion. And in particular, if you look at Beijing in 2003, I mean, it was astonishing in that you had the WHO was finally getting into hospitals to do some infection, uh, to do some, to do some uh, uh, inspection. And uh, you had the Chinese, uh, you know, Chinese government actually, you know, rolling patients out the back door into gurneys. I mean, it was, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be like a Marx Brothers routine. Um, and, you know, this, I mean, this was, this was the extent to which the Chinese government would go to hide cases. Um, and, you know, this, I mean, what this resulted in, once this was exposed, and, and one of my colleagues at Time Asia, uh, a few of my colleagues at Time Asia did remarkable reporting in terms of exposing what was going on, exposing the, the Chinese government complicity in this. Um, you actually saw uh, uh, the Minister of Health uh, resign, the mayor of Beijing. I, actually, I don't recall if the Minister of Health resigned. I know the mayor of Beijing resigned. I mean, and it's very rare for, in fact, it's what really the only time I can think of for a very high ranking uh, Chinese government official to resign as the result of foreign pressure, as a result of a foreign, a foreign press story. Um, so we were very lucky uh, at Time Asia in that we were a magazine based in China um, and we were uh, allowed through various means, some, uh, some uh, uh, approved and some, some unapproved, of, uh, we were, but we were allowed to report pretty widely inside China. Uh, and one of the reasons we were able to break the story and cover the story the way we were was because of that, uh, that access. Uh, unfortunately, today, the Chinese government is much more strict. And much more, uh, uh, much, more, and they're 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 much uh, they're try, they're they're really trying to limit the the amount of reporting that goes in China, and they're trying they, and the the type of reporting that is allowed. So I'm I'm worried that in this case, this time around, we may never get the type of granular kind of step by step as to how this outbreak happened and why it happened, uh, because the Chinese government has clamped down so hard on foreign reporting. And it feels like from what happened 17 years ago to what's happening now, um, the same response seems to be, or the first response by many people is denial. And I know this has kind of happened when it comes to viruses or epidemics um, through the course of history from, you know, the, the plague of 1665 to the influenza outbreak or the Spanish flu of, 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 of 100 years ago to the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. So why should we expect anything different from the Chinese or from any other government that may be facing this? Yeah, I, it's fine. I wrote, I wrote a story in The Atlantic a month or so ago about the four stages of, of, uh, of epidemic response. And the first stage is always denial. Uh, in fact, the first story anywhere about uh, the disease that would come to be known as SARS in late 2002 was a report from a tiny newspaper in Huyan, China, and the, the report basically said there is no epidemic in Huyan. I mean, that was the first mention of this epidemic was a denial of the epidemic. So the, the point is, so the, the four stages of epidemic response uh, are, are denial, uh, and then once you get through denial, you go to panic. Um, which is where you see people uh, uh, starting to act really irrationally, maybe, uh, you know, talking about chloroquine or other sort of unlikely uh, causes, also, uh, uh, cures, and then also starting to blame, lashing out and blaming different people for the outbreak. Like in the Middle Ages, you had people suspecting witches, you had uh, people sort of starting to blame the outbreak on, on Jews. You, you would have this kind of panic response. And then if you get through panic, then you get to fear, which is the kind of... Uh, terror of, of, of the disease being out there somewhere and we're all hunkered down in our, in our homes and we're afraid to go out and we're, and we're um, kind of this sense that it's everywhere and lurking. And then if you get through fear and you're lucky, you finally get to rational response. You finally get to a measured, uh, uh, coordinated, uh, scientifically based rational response. Um, one thing I didn't anticipate with this outbreak this time around is that at least in the U.S. government, we're struggling to get to rational response. It seems like we're struggling to get to a point where the government response uh, is based entirely on what is the soundest and most practical approach. Um, you know, previously on uh, uh, that, it seemed like you would get to that phase, uh, and 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 I think we saw the Chinese government get to that phase this time pretty quickly. The Chinese government got through denial and panic and fear, and they got to rational response. But uh, here in the U.S., we seem to be struggling somewhere between <laughs> stages three and four. Um, but I, you know, but I, but I hope we get there. 
Speaking of responses, um, it seems to be like the government response, whether it's uh, from different countries, like how the US is responding, compared to how China's responding, how Sweden or Z New Zealand's responding, seems to be very different. It's very different on by province or by state that we're seeing here in the States. Um, we got a question here from the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, and they are asking actually, here in Prince George's County, which is um, in Maryland, right outside of Washington, we've had a strong coordinated local government response to COVID-19. How important is collaboration across levels of government for subduing an, a pandemic? I don't, I don't think a, uh, a rational response like I just described is possible without uh, uh, a national, without it being coordinated by a na you know, at a national level. I think what we're seeing with, you know, in, in the US and the federal system uh, feeds into this is a somewhat, you know, a some, somewhat hodgepodge response. And, 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 and I think that that is, uh, there, there's myriad problems there. For one, we know that that no microbe cares about county or state uh, borders um, or, or 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 national borders. So for for one state to have one policy and another state to have another means effectively both states, if they're continuous, uh, will naturally uh, uh, be re be falling into the worst responder of those two states. Um, so there is no you know so there is no uh, uh, there is no effective difference between between two responses. If one uh, state is taking less precautions than the other, both states effectively are then taking the least precaution. So a national coordinated response is essential in terms of trying to, you know, in terms of trying to make real progress in terms of get getting to that rational response piece. Now, you mentioned that you were living in Hong Kong during the SARS epidemic in 2003. Now you're living in Los Angeles. What are the similarities or the big differences of living through two um, major outbreaks? The well, actually, when when this outbreak started, strangely enough, I was living in New York, or I, I was I I, uh, I was I'd been staying in New York for a few months because I was working on a TV show, which was actually about a, uh, a, a society rebuilding after a viral outbreak. Um, and so, but 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 that show very quickly suspended production, and I came back to LA. Uh, in mid-March, just a few days before uh, Governor Newsom here in California issued the safe at home uh, order. Um, the, 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 the similarity is, I mean, I, in, in, in living in Hong Kong, and before I lived in Hong Kong, I lived in Japan, where wearing masks in the winter is actually pretty common. Um, and a lot of people wear masks uh, 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 because, you know, for the reason that, that it's believed to make one less contagious and you don't spread any sickness if you have it. So I, I found wearing masks to be already familiar. Um, and and uh, uh, my mother, who's Japanese, for example, almost always wears a mask in the winter when she goes out in public. Um, I was always a little surprised why Americans were so wary of wearing masks and why it was somehow considered uh, embarrassing or uh, suspicious uh, to wear a mask in public, because it just seemed kind of practical to me. Um, so, uh, for me, the, the, you know, people in California, at least wearing masks when they go to the store, uh, I find it reassuring. Um, and I also just, you know, like I said, I've seen it before having, having lived in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Does it the, feel like the, Groundhog Day for you? Like what happened in Hong Kong and what's happening right now in Los Angeles? No one's on the streets, no one's shopping, no one's, you know, eating yeah, out. Well, the, the emptiness, the, the, at least initially, especially initially the emptiness, you know, the, the, uh, all cities in the thralls of a pandemic look the same, which is they all kind of empty out. Um, what what I feel like we're what we're kind of waiting for, which is this magical signal that everything is okay now and that it's all better. That just never happens. I mean, it's a very gradual process by which uh, uh, you know life returns back to normal. It's not like anyone rings a bell and everyone is just suddenly out shopping. It's it it it's a very it's a it's a slow, almost imperceptible uh, realization that oh, life is getting back to normal now. Speaking of that, um, we got a question here <coughs> from Marina Del Rey in California. I believe that's just um, outside of Los Angeles. You did report in the book that China did some major aggressive screening process right after the uh, the SARS um, epidemic. Uh, they were you know screening for temperature uh, almost everywhere you went. Um, so the question from California is. Is that 
the uh, is that what uh, the U.S. should be doing? Some sort of aggressive screening um, to just ease the mind of Americans coast to coast once we get to the other side of this. Well, I, I think the I mean this is where I, I've been very I, I've been very critical of uh, of the of uh, uh, of of this administration and not focusing more on some kind of national testing program to try to establish uh, some baseline as to who has it and who doesn't. With SARS, thermal imaging was pretty effective in terms of detecting who might have it or who didn't because people, it, 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 there weren't as many asymptomatic carriers. Um, with this, with this uh, virus, because there are so many asymptomatic carriers, I don't think thermal imaging, thermal imaging which detects uh, whether someone has a fever or not, I don't think that kind of imaging is going to be as effective in terms of establishing um, who has it or who doesn't. So it's very hard, short of a national testing program, to try to effectively come up with some kind of screening measure to say who is safe to go back to work and who isn't. Do you think the stricter um, methods um, mm. work faster? I just based on from you know what I read you said in the book from what they did in Singapore to what they did in China, was, did that help curtail the virus? Um, in those countries, the well, I mean, I think that the the, the there, well, there's two there's two different issues. I mean, you're talking about are you talking about the the measures that were taken in hospitals, the measures that were taken uh, at airports, for example, the measures taken by like, everyday people. So yes, outside the hospital. Yeah, well, I, well, I think wearing I think wearing face masks, which is the first of those measures, which you know, which which in the U.S. we didn't do for some time. So I think that does make a difference, and I think that is helpful. Um, I think in in uh, in terms of travel, in terms of 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 of, of people being feeling safe to travel again, um, with SARS because of the thermal imaging piece, it was possible because people, if you had, you know, usually with SARS, if you were infectious, you had a fever. Uh, in with this disease, we're seeing that that may not be the case. Um, but again, it's very hard to know with SARS because, um, as I wrote in the book, what happened was in at some point in May. Uh, the kind of the, 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 the diseases sort of grip on society seemed to loosen. Um, and this was the point at which we were absolutely fearing the worst because China had been hiding cases. China had been going to these ridiculous lengths to hide the severity of the outbreak uh, you know, throughout the country. So we assumed because China was hiding cases, we assumed that the outbreak was much worse than it really was. Um, so you couldn't, because we couldn't get a clear picture as to the severity of it, uh, we thought, oh my God, this is, you know, the, the, you know, this, this must be just destroying China's hospitals. It turned out actually that at that point, which was late April, or early May, the disease, the, 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 uh, the, the number of cases was actually beginning to decrease. The number, the daily, the daily count was actually beginning to decrease. Um, and the severity of the outbreak was actually beginning to kind of loosen or so, it it's very hard. I mean, it's you know, it's hard to say to what we can attribute that. Part of it was that uh, hospitals began to take better you know measures when new when people showed up when they were sick. Uh, society as a whole had taken uh, begun you know had, had, was wearing masks, was practicing social distancing, even though we didn't call it that then. Uh, you know, people were taking these precautions. But something else happened, which I have been uh, I have I've thought about a lot since it began, which was it appeared that there was something in the virus itself that was seasonal. Um, coronaviruses are, are sort of famously mutable. It's an RNA virus, so it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have, a, it doesn't have a, a DNA, so it doesn't have kind of the self-correcting uh, genetic mechanism that, that DNA viruses have. But because it's an RNA virus, it's more prone to mutation, it's more prone to error. Uh, and over time, mutations in viruses tend to make them less uh, uh, less, less, less deadly for human beings because as you know, virus uh, getting into a body, it's in, it's not in the virus's best interest to kill the host. It's in the virus' best interest for the host to stay alive and to spread more viruses. So over time, it's you know most viruses mutate toward less deadly rather than more deadly. Um, so I believe in 2003 that some seasonality did play into our favor and we got lucky and by in May, especially as China warms up and Hong Kong warms up, Hong Kong can get in the 80s uh, in May, uh, the, you know, the virus seemed to sort of loosen its hold a little bit on the city. And just, um, just to wrap up here, I know we're running close on time, but I do want to do a major shout out to the scientists and doctors from China to this country and all the hard work they're doing to you know, protect us. 
and, um, and find uh, cures to these viruses. You did mention here in, um, in your book, and I just want to quote it, does say, uh, yoga instructors in Santa Monica and investment bankers in New York have no idea the role that a few scientists, doctors, and public health officials in Hong Kong play in keeping them pale and hardy, which is still the case. Do you still speak to some of these uh, scientists that you spoke with in the book, and what is their take um, on what's happening now? Well, I mean, a lot of them have gone on from, I mean, this was kind of a signal moment in some of their careers. Uh, some of them, because, you know, Malik Paris, for example, who isolated the virus at HKU, has gone on to some eminence, uh, and he has a chair, I think, at Oxford, somewhere in Oxford. Um, but uh, uh, Guan Yi, I believe, is still on the ground in, in uh, Hong Kong and collaborating and working with uh, the WHO and different agencies. Um, I think what... Uh, uh, one thing that was put in place uh, after SARS in 2003 was a, uh, you know, was a was a better uh, uh, pandemic re response uh, and 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 and, uh, and infectious disease screening program. Um, greater collaboration between the WHO uh, and China and the CDC was put in place, um, and we had, you know, at, in in different labs throughout China, we had uh, U.S. and 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 international representatives working with their Chinese counterparts to try to find any potential outbreaks. Um, so uh, I had hoped in, you know, coming out of SARS in 2003, that we had learned a lesson or, and, and had seen what an emerging disease outbreak looks like and had kind of discovered best practices and learned best practices so that next time we would know how to respond. Um, and that because I, you know, in the book, I make pretty clear that there will be another zoonotic virus that you know jumps the species very um it, it's inevitable it's a you know it, it's it just seems to be a part of human progress or what passes for progress uh so i had hoped that 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 we would have uh next time a better response based on best practices that we had gotten and learned from this from from 2003 it seems like this time around uh instead of having learned from 2003 we pretty much forgot most of those lessons and our response, uh, you know, really has left a lot to be desired. Uh, I don't know whether this was because SARS was never really that big a deal in the United States, that the Iraq war was happening right around the same time. So media's attention was very much focused uh, toward that. So people didn't realize how, you know, like that, that we had dodged a bullet in 2003. People didn't understand that. Um, unfortunately, you know, that, 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 that gun was still loaded uh, and now we know what that, what, now we know what an emerging pandemic looks like. Well, Carl, we want to thank you so much. Carl Taro Gren Greenfeld is the author of The China Syndrome. I highly recommend that everybody grab a copy of it and read it now. And it gives you a good outline of what we're experiencing now. Thank you, Taro. Thank you so much.